I was uh, asked to talk a little bit about what kind of a new order there will be after the uh, COVID pandemic ends, if it ever ends. Uh, and that will, uh, in that comment, I will address the specific question that you asked. Great, thanks. Uh, um, I think the most important thing, though, is we try to speculate about a, a new order after COVID is uh, to start with humility in the sense that uh, there's just an awful lot we don't know about this current crisis. We're at an early stage. Um, you might call it like watching act one of a five act play. And uh, we don't know how uh, act five is going to turn out. Uh, for example, we don't know as much as we thought about the virus itself, uh, the ways of transmission and uh, where everybody was focusing on contact early on. Uh, we also uh, thought that it might be seasonal, that with heat and humidity, it might decline the way flu declines. But in fact, what we're seeing is a huge increase in the hottest and most humid parts of the United States, 80% in the last two weeks in the United States. Uh, so there's a lot we don't know about the virus. Uh, the other thing we don't know much about is how bad this economic uh, recession is going to be. Uh, you know, it's certainly not going to be a V-shaped recovery, though I'll leave that to the second panel. Um, but whether it's a U and a short U or whether it's a long L, we don't know the answer to that either. So that's why I suggest that any predictions about uh, the order after COVID um, have to be uh, combined with that humility and, and caveats. The other thing I might point out uh, is that we sometimes assume that when there are big events um, or big causes, big causes have big effects. Not always true. Sometimes little causes have big effects. And uh, some big causes don't have big effects as you might expect. And for that, let me take you back to the 1918 influenza epidemic, which was huge. It was much larger than the current uh, COVID pandemic is in terms of its lethality uh, as we know it so far. Uh, the uh, influenza epidemic killed more people uh, than World War I did. And uh, yet when the historians and sociologists look at the 1920s, uh, they don't see a big effect of the influenza epidemic. You do see uh, uh, some effects, but uh, not the uh, geopolitical earth-shaking changes that one might predict from such a, a huge lethal uh, event. Uh, now, some people say that's because it was masked by World War I. Uh, others say it uh, was before the age of social media, so we can't generalize from that. But I do think it reminds us to be cautious in assuming that uh, big events uh, are big causes, which therefore have big effects. Um, that leads me to this question that many people have speculated about is this coronavirus going to be the point which tips uh, world politics where China replaces the United States over the United States? That this is the uh, uh, going to be the turning point. Um, I suspect this is uh, overdone. I don't see that as likely. Uh, I think the uh, if you look at America, at three types of power, military, economic, and soft power, uh, in military power, the United States is more than three times uh, larger as measured by budgets uh, than China. Uh, in economic power, China is measured at exchange rates about two thirds the size of the American economy. Sometimes people say China has passed the U.S using a measure called purchasing power parity, but that's really a measure of welfare. When you're measuring power, you don't import oil uh, 
or jet engines at purchasing power parity, you use them at exchange rates. And by that measure, China is uh, two thirds the size of the US. And when you look at soft power, while China has been placing enormous uh, resources into trying to increase its soft power, uh, it hasn't had as a very good return on investment. Public opinion polls show a great deal of suspicion of China uh, uh, in most areas except for Africa, as some countries in Africa, and some in Latin America. But uh, by and large, if you take the Soft Power 30 Index, which is published uh, in London every year, which looks at the top 30 countries in terms of their soft power, um, China comes out number 27 or 28, and the U.S. is usually in the top four or five. Um, when you have that degree of disparity in power on all three dimensions, the argument that uh, somehow this coronavirus is going to overcome that in a short time, uh, not very likely. Uh, these larger in terms of power politics um, are are more resilient. They take longer to, to change than, than uh, uh, that people realize. What that means is that we don't have to uh, be hysterical about China. Uh, China, I agree with what uh, Miriam said. I think China is a challenge. There are problems that we have to face up to with China. Um, but the idea that somehow it's about to uh, pass us or to swallow us, uh, we're that we can't cope with it. I don't. I think that the danger there is we overreact, and if we create a new cold war as a result of our hysteria, uh, the net effect of that will be that we're we unable to cooperate with China on areas where we do have to cooperate, and the pandemic is a perfect example of that, uh, and climate change is another one. So the ability to uh, have a cooperative rivalry, we both cooperate and compete simultaneously, is going to be the secret uh, to success. Now, what have we learned from the uh, from the performance so far of our two countries um, uh, after the uh, onset of the coronavirus pandemic? I think you can make it that both countries failed. Um, the initial response by uh, Xi Jinping and by Donald Trump was denial, which led to delay, which cost lives. And that was replaced then by blame shifting. And that was then replaced by propaganda, which basically tried to change the narrative of its initial uh, failure by uh, what's sometimes called mask diplomacy, providing uh, medical equipment and masks and so forth. Uh, but if you look at the public opinion polls, uh, you'll find that it's been that successful, that uh, people suspect China's motives and it hasn't repaired that uh, loss in soft power. And of course, on the American side, uh, Trump has tried to blame China for it all uh, and uh, or the World Health Organization. And that essentially has just a bit American soft power. So I can think you could argue that both of these two countries, the two largest economies in the world, two largest national economies, uh, have uh, failed this test, um, which is rather ironic to see you say during the Cold War <clears throat> that the only thing that would bring the United States and the Soviet Union together would be the threat uh, from an alien creature from Mars. Well, we've had the, the equivalent of an alien creature, a virus, uh, which doesn't care at all about the nationality of the humans it kills, and yet we fail to respond uh, in any other than nationalist and tribal ways. Uh, people say, well, yes, but you're just utopian. After all, you, I just wrote a book called Do Moral Matter with a question mark in the title. So what would you expect from somebody like that? I would submit that uh, there was an alternative uh, to how we could deal this, and it still may be an alternative. Uh, what I describe in Do Morals Matter 
is the origins of something like the Marshall Plan, where it's not whether you define your national interest in whether you protect your national interest, it's how broad the United States give away 2% of its gross domestic product to help Europe after World War II. And uh, that was good for us and good for the European. So in that sense, the moral issue is not whether you protect the national interest, it's whether you define the national interest broadly enough so that what's good for you is good for others as well. And that's, I think, where we failed in this current crisis. Uh, imagine, for example, that uh, Trump and Xi Jinping, instead of getting into this propaganda warfare, had said, let's get the group of 20 to set up a special fund to ensure that there are vaccines available for poor countries so that essentially there isn't a reservoir of coronavirus in the southern half of the globe which will come back and hurt us on second and third wave. After all, in 1918, the second and third waves of the influenza epidemic killed more people than the first wave. So you can make an argument out of self-interest. We ought to set aside funds for a special uh, provision of vaccine, particularly to the health sectors of poor countries, before we use it all up on ourselves. Uh, that would essentially be a little bit uh, like what Jean Monnet did after World War II when he proposed the European Coal and Steel Commission. Um, Germany had invaded France three times in 70 years. The natural inclination after in 1945 was, well, hold Germany take away the war or star land from them. Don't let them restore their strength. Instead, Monet said, if we do that, we're just going to repeat it. Suppose we take a new approach and join with Germany and Italy and form a European coal and steel community, which became known as the Schumann Plan and eventually became the European Economic Community and the European Union. That was transformational leadership, which made a huge difference to history. You can't imagine Germany and France going to war today. Uh, it was possible, I would submit, that uh, that China and the U.S. could have done something like that in regard to a special fund for poor countries. It's still possible, I would submit, that if you have a change of government in Washington, uh, I don't imagine it for this administration, but if you had a change in government, you could imagine setting up a special fund in which we would say, if we invent the, virus, the vaccine first, or if we have a vaccine uh, 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 that works, uh, we will set aside 10% of it for helping the health sectors in poor countries before we say we'll use 100% of it on ourselves before we sell it to others. Uh, that might be an interesting initiative for the Biden administration, if there is one take. It would enormously restore American soft power, but it would be an example, as I said in Do Morals Matter, of defining the national interest in a way which is good for us, but good for others at the same time. So that would be my specific recommendation of what I think we can do in this current situation, which I think would have a transformative effect on the order that will follow the pandemic crisis not what we see so far in act one of the five act pay is that uh we're seeing a decline in economic globalization that was already underway but i think it will be uh increased by the effects of the pandemic um and uh but the one thing i think we're not seeing that many people predicted which is the authoritarian model proving more powerful than the, de the democratic model uh, that was the conventional wisdom at the beginning of the pandemic. But it's interesting to see that uh, uh, the countries, that you, some of the countries have done worst are democracies. Some of the ones that have done worst are autocracies. And some of the ones that have done best are democracies. 
uh, look at New Zealand or South Korea or Germany, uh, it may be that it's not the question of democracy or autocracy as much as the idea that populist nationalist leadership, the uh, macho bravado of the type you see in Trump or uh, you see in uh, Bolsonaro and so forth, those are the types of leadership that have failed, not democracies as such. Or maybe to go back to a uh, an issue that uh, uh, that we've thought about before, uh, maybe having uh, more women leaders would help. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's early in the stage of this crisis to know the outcome. I don't expect it to reverse the relative positions of the U.S. and China. I don't think it means that autocracies have done better than democracies. And I do think there is a prospect for transformative leadership to uh, take an initiative along the lines I described with making sure the vaccines are available to poor countries out of humanitarian interests and out of our self-interest. So let me stop there.